Why did Nixon get to do what Obama gets to do? Why didn't Nixon get to do to his enemies what the Obama administration gets to do to me? Greeting Toastmasters, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. I hope over explaining the obvious answer to this rhetorical question doesn't insult your intelligence. Everybody knows that the protection of citizens' rights under a fascist tyranny is non-existent. Let's not mince words here. America is under an oppressive regime. As bad as Nixon blew it, he was still operating in a constitutional republic that quickly and forcefully checked his overreach. Not so now. Those checks and balances have been rendered null and void by Obama and his appointee in the Treasury. I was targeted because the IRS mole got a hold of what I wrote about Ob Obama administration. I was intimidated by the auditor to keep me from detaining counsel that would interfere with their political interrogation. I was interrogated to discover more about what I was writing and of course to punish me for my dissent. When I had the audacity to complain about it, two agencies of the Treasury the auditors and the cops that investigate the auditors for wrongdoing colluded to shut me up. Think about that. Two different agencies within the Treasury got on the phone and put in motion a plan to shut me up about their crime. That must make me a pretty important guy. So what Nixon was chomping at the bit to do to his detractors none of whom were audited, by the way, the local IRS agents under the direction of the appointee of the President of the United States did to me. They really did it. Can you believe it? Have I hit the lottery or what? Now that is an open question. In a constitutional republic like America, there's no doubt I hit the lottery. In a fascist tyranny, I'm toast. What you decide at the end of this trial will determine which that's going to be. You're going to discover that I'm a really positive guy that just loves to think that for all of America's faults, in the end, justice can and will prevail. And there's a reason for that. You are that reason. You, the jurors, are the only reason justice can and will prevail. You are why a bankrupt carpenter can stand up to the most feared agency on the face of the planet because in that wonderful system, the jury is the law of the land. The Fourth Amendment guarantees that I don't have to wait for the apology that will never come from a government that has turned to crime. Let me read from Richard Nixon's articles of impeachment. And I quote, he, Richard Nixon, has through his subordinated agents endeavored to cause in violation of constitutional rights of citizens, income tax audits, or other income tax investigation to be initiated or conducted in a discriminatory manner. Notice the operative word endeavored. That means that someone caught him in the attempt. Even though he failed, his attempt was still worthy of an article of impeachment. It's like an attempted robbery, where nobody lost anything, but the perpetrator still goes to jail. So if Nixon was impeached for an attempt, what is the punishment for actually committing the robbery? What is the penalty for being successful at marshalling the subordinated and the agents of the government to rob a citizen his rights? What punitive deterrent will keep that from happening again? You, the jury, get to decide. This mole didn't just pick up any old Tea Party diatribe. What he picked up was an account of a 21-year-old prophecy revealed to me by the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This prophecy declared in no uncertain terms 
that Barack Obama is America's Idi Amin. I don't know what that does for you, but it gives me the chills. It was all a divine setup. It was a plan devised by God that this bankrupt carpenter would wander into a patriotic meeting and begin annoying everyone with his crazy prophetic dream. What heaven only knew is that I wasn't just reporting a true prophetic metaphor. I was also bait at the end of a hook too delicious for the IRS to pass up. They swallowed it hook, line, and sinker during that piranha frenzy we all know of as the illegal IRS targeting scandal. And now they're going to be made to pay. But only if this is still America. It was awkward recounting this dream, even to friends. The only consolation I have is that it's absolutely true. I believe it. The metaphor is entirely substantiated. Idi Amin was an affable guy. He had a winning smile. He was a great public speaker. Like Obama, all that charisma covered up the depraved policies that went on to destroy the wonderful economy the Ugandan people inherited of their British forebears. Amin's public safety unit tortured and killed 30,000 of his own dissenting citizens. You heard me right. He called it the public safety unit. Chilling, isn't it? So why was the Obama administration able to subject me to intimidation and interrogation? Because the IRS is his public safety unit. That's why. Barack Obama gets to do what Nixon couldn't do because his America is an oppressive tyranny. Our America was meant to be a constitutional republic where citizens' rights are sacred and the agents of the government honor their oath to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. Now, there are really good people in every station of government. The IRS auditors, the TIGCA, those cops that I was talking about, United States attorneys, the Office Special, of Special Counsel, the myriad of offices of inspector generals and the FBI. But under the present administration, they are understandably afraid to honor their oath. We should help them with that. Now let's shift gears here. I don't want to cold cock you later by my outlandish, ridiculous demand for damages. So I'm just going to let you have it right now. I'm suing the Treasury for $1,001,300 and whatever else you, the jury, may, in your good judgment, deem appropriate. Now, that is a number I wouldn't write out for you because I'm sure I'd misplace a zero somewhere. <laughs> so I won't. Now that I've dropped that bomb, let's see if I have the proof and the claim to back that up. Allow me to summarize now and fill in the details later. An angel visited me in the 70s and told me that I'd be a writer, and I didn't know what he was referring to. That was something. But now what? Nothing. Nothing really happened. In the 80s, another time, and I say it's an angel, and I say that because it was a vision in the middle of the night and I didn't see an angel, but still. In the 80s, the angel pointed me to a little known fact in history that the phrase rebellion to tyrants is obedience to God was Ben Franklin's idea for the great seal of the United States. Both he and Thomas Jefferson favored that design over the one that we finally got today. But then what? Nothing really happened after that, but I can never forget that wonderful experience. So that was in the 80s, later in the 90s, I saw Idi Amin ascending a hill driving a U.S. government vehicle. All I could say is, 
Wow, what was that? Who knows? But now what? Nothing came of it. It was just a dream, like anybody's dream. At least that's what I thought. In 2011, my business crashed. It turned out to be exactly 21 years later that I would rediscover that dream in one of my notes. And 21 is three times seven, by the way, and I think that's very interesting. I noted the date that I recorded this dream about Obama, and I went straight to the internet to see where Barack Obama might have been on that date. And I discovered that he was installed as the editor of the Harvard Law Review exactly seven days after my dream. Isn't that something? Question is, now what? Things start to accelerate. I'm reminded of the typewriter the angel pointed me to in the 70s, and so created a flyer declaring that Barack Obama is America's Idi Amin. I know how crazy that sounds, but the, the way this came together, I couldn't come to any other conclusion. So I thought of who I might give them to, and I decided that tea parties might have an interest in it. So I took them all to a bunch of tea parties. And what was really interesting is that after 30 days of distributing these from, to everyone I could find, I was audited for the first time in my 33-year career. That's some coincidence. But it doesn't end there. I still have the audit in my hand. I walked into my office with the audit in my hand and opened my 1990 storage binder to a note that had no other context. And it was giving me instructions what to do if I was audited by the IRS. Now that is something. The question is, now what? When I called for my interview, the auditor insinuated that things would not go well for me if I retained counsel. This is my first audit, and she's threatening harm if I don't come alone. After the audit, I'm asked to tell about my writing, which I'm actually flattered to do. After reading and recounting a number of them, I asked her if she really thought she had time for any more of this, and she pushed everything to the side on her desk, leaned forward, and made it very clear I had her full attention. She sat listening to more of my stories in one sitting than any other human being on the face of the planet, including my wife. Isn't that something? Now what? I contacted an attorney and asked what I should do about this crime. And he told me to avoid doing anything or saying anything that will attract their attention because they are not my friends and will cause great harm if I do. So I write out my observations in a letter, and I, I actually addressed it to the auditor, but I took my attorney's advice and just delivered it a dated copy to the attorney. So I was bewildered for two entire years after that about what should be done about this obvious crime. During that time, I was struggling to make payments on the $1,900 additional assessment, which I didn't disagree with, by the way. And I had, by the time uh, two years had passed, I had paid off $1,300 of that assessment when the IRS scandal broke. I interpreted that as a perfect time to finally ask the auditor for her e email and deliver that letter. I recounted my allegations that the audit was a response to my having distributed anti-Obama flyers, and she deadpanned with short, curt responses. She'd say, so what do you want? Which I would reply with a little bit more of what I understood the case was, and then there would be a dead space, and she would say, so what do you want to do? She conspicuously avoided denying my allegations, leaving dead space 
just seeing what else I might say. And that was kind of like a continuation of the original soft interrogation. What do you want? She finally asserted at the end that the audit had originated from a random computer process that she had no control over and so could not have been related to my writing. I replied, of course I expected you to say such a thing. After all, what on earth else could you say? To which she offered little objection. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, there is no possible way that this agent can admit to the truth, even if she wanted to. What would happen to her if she did? We kn all know it wouldn't go well for her. That's how crime syndicates work. I ask you again, what is the penalty for being successful at marshalling the subordinated and agents of the government to the rob the citizen his rights? We're talking about the Treasury of the United States here. We're talking about a criminal syndicate with enormous assets. What punitive deterrent will keep that from happening again? You, the jury, get to decide. You get to decide if one billion, one thousand, three hundred dollars is even close to being enough. Thank you.